Spelling my What is that? just make sure that we can see. are you able to see us uh aspen and gilbert yes doc before i we get into uh today's topics my lovely bride wanted to uh, give a quick announcement she's been able to get her website up and rolling and her services so why don't you take it away janice okay well <clears throat> many of you will know me that i um I'm a co-founder of PrevMed, and I'm the health coach in PrevMed, and I've worked with many of you. But um, I have created, and if you read the newsletter today, it's on it. I've created my own website, which is called JaniceDerickson.com. And I'm excited to offer a blend of Western and Eastern medicine. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a Tai Chi for Health instructor which is a Center for Disease Control endorsed form of Tai Chi, Tai Chi for arthritis and fall prevention. And there's been many studies about it. And I'm also a health coach. So um, the announcement in the newsletter and on today's YouTube is to, if anyone is interested in any of those three services or a combination of physical therapy, Tai Chi and health coaching, please go to my website and you will find an email and a phone number there to contact me. And I would love to talk to you about your interests. Thank you, Janice. Um, so Janice didn't give herself enough credit. She's got a lot more education than I do. She's got two doctorates, three master's programs and a three year degree in health coaching. So she knows what she's uh, talking about and she's getting very, um, and, tai chi. And, and well, yeah, and some Tai Chi stuff. Oh, I didn't realize you were still behind me. <laughs> uh, so she knows what she's talking about and uh, it's great to get that kind of blend between Eastern and Western medicine. I'm very excited about it and thank you for having me on your program. You're welcome. So one of the things I'm learning from a couple of perspectives is the importance of breathing in managing high blood pressure. They do a lot of that in Tai Chi. They've known that in Eastern medicine for a long time. It's just not been transferred that well to, uh, to Western medicine. Uh, actually, I, a, uh, a device manufacturer called me a couple of weeks ago and said, we've got this device. And I said, oh boy. Um, but then I found out it was a, um, it's biofeedback for slowing your breathing down it's actually been FDA approved and recommended by the American Heart Association. I was impressed, especially once I started looking at the science. Um, we're preparing some information on that. Uh, it's actually dropped uh, my own blood pressure about 20 points systolic, um, lower than it's been in decades. So very interesting, but more on that to come. Today's program is going to be about uh, dentists, should they provide pre-diabetes, pre easy for me to say, huh? Pre-diabetes preventive care. Uh, now this may sound like, well, if I'm not a dentist, why do I care? Well, here's the thing. You know, we think we've got a pandemic going on with COVID-19, but 
Even in the midst of COVID-19, more people continue to die from heart attack. More people continue to get disabled from stroke. Um, not to mention dementia, not to mention the other things that happens from uh, prediabetes and diabetes. And yet we seem to think that's okay. If you look at our primary care manpower out there, the primary care docs that we have, Number one, there's not enough to deal with the prediabetes uh, pandemic. Number two, the ones that we have don't know that much about prediabetes. It's not me com uh, complaining and criticizing other docs. It's the science. We've covered that in multiple other videos. And what I just fail to understand is uh, at one point, gosh, over half of my my patients when we first started, were dentists and dental, uh, dental providers, dental professionals. The reason for that is dentists get up every morning, go, they go into work, and half of the adults they see have bleeding gums. And if you haven't heard this, we've mentioned it a few times on the, the channel, that's a big deal. If you have bleeding gums when you go to the dentist, because the number one cause of gum disease I'll tell you in a minute during our, uh, during our uh, program. But once you realize what the number one cause of, of gum disease is, you realize why uh, gum disease is associated with heart attack and stroke. And yet <clears throat> I've worked with some really good preventive pre prevention professionals. It's been very interesting. Uh, I might expect it from other docs to question why dentists uh, and others would want to get into prediabetes prevention. But a prevention doc? Why would a prevention doc complain about that? Again, we'll talk about all that a little bit later. Previous topics, osteoarthritis and heart disease. We talked about that uh, recently. Is there a connection? The answer, I would have said up until a month or two ago, I would have said probably not. The answer is yes, there is. And I was surprised to find out. Um, I knew that there was a, a major link with rheumatoid arthritis and the other inflammatory diseases. But this is not the inflammatory type of arthritis. It's just the wear and tear type joint disease. And yes, there is a connection. We talked about it last week. If you missed it, you can take a look. Intermittent fasting, why are we still debating it? Uh, some of the bottom line on that is we, maybe we shouldn't be, but a recent JAMA article came out uh, throwing question about uh, intermittent fasting. Um, right, just when we thought it was time for IF to become prime time. Uh, for those of you who are deep into understanding about prediabetes and diabetes, is the core here, is the problem beta cell destruction or just dysfunction? We talked about that. And again, uh, one of our most popular ones over the recent past has been five supplements. Supplements are always a popular topic. These were five supplements that would boost cardiovascular health. And speaking of those, taking one of those key supplements, omega-3s, and turning it into doing what big pharma always does, take a very effective supplement and turn it into uh, a prescription medication. That's exactly what Vesipa is. And we had a lot of good discussion about Vesipa and the super omega-3s. Just a comment about the webinars. We were able to get the webinar program up and rolling again, uh, focusing on the IR, insulin resistance, gut sugar webinar. That is becoming very, very popular very quickly. Um, we're talking about how to make the, uh, the full webinar series uh, uh, available to people in uh, the gold and, uh, and platinum subscription programs. Online courses are, are continuing to pick up. Uh, our most popular online course uh, from day one has been the cardiovascular inflammation course, but now the uh, insulin resistance course is starting to, to really pick up a lot of uh, interest uh, a lot of positive feedback regarding that. And again, any of these you can access through our website. Our website, we'll talk about that in a minute too. Speaking of the memberships, uh, Michelle, Janice, um, JR, been doing a lot of work on the subscription programs, very, very popular. And um, 
we're going to be adding a, a third level, the uh, platinum membership. That's similar to what uh, people that have gotten the twenty one hundred dollar program in the past, but it provides some significant extra benefit. The book. I'm so uh, pleased to announce that we've gotten the the book to the um, to the publisher, and he tells us he think it'll he thinks it'll be about four weeks. So we're going to start. Uh, putting some information out to help uh, help generate some interest, help uh, uh, create more of a rollout effect. I think next week, Chris will have us some information on an article about stress tests. It came from the uh, Washington Post. So the title of the book is uh, gonna be Prevention Secrets or Prevention Myths what a stress test can't or why a stress test can't predict a heart attack and the tests that can so uh the, obviously the poster boy for that is tim russert um he was ma managing his blood pressure uh he was continuing to gain his midsection but he was exercising a lot a lot of treadmill work um it had to adjust his uh, blood pressure medications they got a little bit nervous about what was going on with him. He and his doctor decided to do a stress test. It was done like March or April, passed it with flying colors. He said, Phew. you know, he was very glad to hear that he was okay and not at risk. And he died from a heart attack at work a couple of months later. So we tell that story, but then we go way deep into the science of why, you know, why that's such a common story. Everybody I've asked so far knows somebody or has heard of somebody that died from a heart attack after having a negative stress test. Again, there's clear scientific reasons behind it. We go into that. And more importantly, it's not that we're bashing on stress tests. It's that we're saying there are better options available. Um, <clears throat> there's good uses for stress tests. They help us understand uh, our endurance, a lot of good things about our body, but people use them wrong, wrongly. Maybe that's the right word. Now, what's the, the interesting article in the Washington Post is, is saying, look, since COVID, stress tests have plummeted. And that's a good thing. So he's coming uh, from the same perspective that I'm coming from. It's one of their medical, uh, it's a physician, uh, medical staff writer for them or a medical editorial writer. Um, and then he goes in and starts talking about a couple of the, um, the uh, articles, recent articles that we've covered in this channel, like the um, ischemia article, which showed that, you know what? Bypass grafts don't prevent heart attacks. And I think it was the Promise uh, study, which um, again showed that I believe that was the one showing that stents didn't didn't prevent heart attacks. So basically what they're saying is, look, lifestyle is important. There are better ways to predict uh, heart attack and stroke risk. <clears throat> and let's focus on those. Um, and the whole question that, that permeates through that article is, if stress tests were such an important, reliable indicator of something as important as a heart attack, why have they decreased so much during COVID? So I mentioned the uh, website uh, a little bit earlier. We've gone from what, 300 visits per month, uh, less than a year ago, to over 6,000 visits per month now and continuing to climb. Uh, Sam's working through some technical challenges, uh, causing a little bit of slowness on the website. And I think as he continues to to fix that, we'll continue to get uh, growth in that space. So uh, take a look. If you haven't been to the website, you'll see why a lot of people are starting to visit it. It has to do with uh, things like uh, looking at the services that we offer, the courses, the online courses, the webinars are a big draw, but uh, the content is perhaps the biggest draw. So if you look at the content that we present on this channel and think about, okay, you know, sometimes it's kind of, uh, Brewer doesn't talk right. Sometimes uh, it's not so easy to follow the verbal. We're, we're getting it all in writing right there on the website. 
So speaking of understanding, uh, we're going to start doing a little bit of a series on health literacy. Um, <clears throat> and why are we doing that? Well, because you guys need to start thinking about if you can understand the stuff that we cover on this channel, there's not a lot of people, especially in the baby boomer uh, category, the baby boomer demographic that can understand. In fact, look at this health literacy skills of U.S. adults by age group and the group that has the uh, lowest health literacy is 65 and older. That's obviously the group that needs the most because that's the group that has high blood pressure, free diabetes, all of the problems that we deal with. So you need to begin to realize that if you can keep up with this channel, you're clearly not your typical baby boomer in terms of healthcare literacy. I've had several conversations over the past week with patients and with other folks who said, yeah, you know what? I have referred so many people to you and it's sometimes like banging your head against a wall, helping people understand the importance of what we're talking about. These hidden diseases, these hidden problems like prediabetes where you have no symptoms, but it's burning your tissues. So I'll go uh, hopefully quickly through some of this. There's a national uh, assessment that's going on. It's been driven by the CDC and some other groups. 71% of old of adults older than 60 had difficulty using print materials. 80% had difficulty using uh, forms and charts. 70% had difficulty with interpreting numbers and doing calculations. Despite the low health literacy risk for older adults, we can improve. And that's one of the things that we, we're working on with this channel. Hopefully over the next, actually we've got some uh, recruiting um, uh, information out going into LinkedIn today, uh, starting to look to someone who can help us get more healthcare literacy. There's three decades of research studies that have consistently found health materials exceed the reading ability of their intended audiences. You know, it sounds like the pot calling the kettle black. We know that. <laughs> and again, the folks that uh, can keep up with this well enough to uh, to have an interest in the things that we cover. Again, my hats are, are off to you. We've got plenty of doctors and healthcare folks who uh, who use this content for their own their own training. A couple of other comments in this space. We have audacity to say people have low literacy skills when our material is just poorly designed. Um, oral communication is very important. Math skills, we need to understand that a lot of people can't interpret the stuff that we talk about on graphs. Um, and there are specific skills uh, that we need on the internet to, to help transfer and obtain healthcare information. Uh, stuff that are clearly our parents can't do, but even a lot of our peers, you know, many of us are in our 60s and older, and a lot of our peers do not uh, pick up the stuff that we're, we're understanding and we're talking about. So in future discussions on health literacy, we'll talk about age-related sensory and cognitive changes, you know, prediabetes, one, probably, arguably, one of the major causes of dementia, decreasing cognition. There's a reason why the top scientists in this field called call, uh, dementia type three diabetes. So we need, again, to start understanding uh, what we're dealing with when we communicate with others. The use and challenges of using e-health tools among uh, aging patients, self-management and empowering patients to obtain information for themselves, ways to improve health literacy for older adults. Those are all other things that we will be covering now, um, I'm going to uh, go on mute for a second, and I think uh, Gilbert or Aspen will be giving us the water ball, and then we'll start into prediabetes and dentists.
So thank you guys. Um, if there's one thing recurring rant that I have, it's that um, we think we've got a COVID uh, pandemic, but we're clueless because we've had long before the COVID epidemic and during the COVID epidemic, we've got a pre-diabetes epidemic and everybody seems to be okay with it. We seem to be ignoring it, um, <clears throat> including our the folks that should be leading the charge against this problem, our doctors. And uh, quite often the rant sounds like it's turning into a criticism of docs again. You know, here's the here's the thing. We're, uh, docs, I've, I've spent a lifetime recruiting and managing uh, doctors. They're just like everybody else. Most of them are really good people, and um, they they continue to respond to their environment. Uh, docs tend to blame some of the the problems in managing in detecting and managing prediabetes on insurance companies and patients. And the reality is. Insurance companies and patients, both as groups, have a lot they need to level up, as well as the doctors. So here we go. We're going to talk about prediabetes and um, use of another healthcare, or participation of another healthcare group, a healthcare group that tends to see patients more often than primary care doctors, better access, dentists. So despite strong evidence and national policy supporting type two diabetes prevention, little is known about type two diabetes prevention in the primary care setting. I would add editorially that uh, we do know that it's not good. Um, this article is uh, the National Survey of Primary Care Physicians Knowledge, Practices and Perceptions about Diabetes, Prediabetes. So you'll see the term PCP, Primary Care Physician, PCPs had limited knowledge of risk factors for prediabetes screening, laboratory diagnostic criteria for prediabetes, and management recommendations for patients with prediabetes. Only 36% of PCPs refer patients to a diabetes prevention lifestyle change program as their initial management approach. 43% discuss metformin immediately. So in other words, you know, as is typical, uh, they go straight to the prescription pad. Uh, me sure, medications are very appropriate, but their uh, lifestyle is three times more important. I mean, we've we've covered those that research, that science multiple times. PCP, PCPs believe that barriers to type 2 diabetes prevention are both at the individual level. In other words, well, I told the patient to lose weight and he didn't. Well, it's not that simple. And at the system level as well, lack of weight loss resources. PCPs blame the problem on uh, patients and insurance companies. So if you look at this infographic here from Helio, 8% of primary care docs in a survey um, knew that the ADA recommended a minimum weight loss of 7%. 25% may be identifying patients as having prediabetes when they actually have diabetes. And we see that a lot. And um, it wasn't covered in that survey, but as you know, we see it time and time again, each month uh, in, on this YouTube channel and with the practice that quite often docs tell patients, you're fine, I checked your A1C and you don't have a problem. Or more often, much more often, they, they say, you're fine, I checked your fasting glucose. And uh, the patient had full-blown diabetes. Uh, 40 per, back to the Helio survey, 42% identified the correct range uh, of fasting glucose to indicate pre-diabetes, less than half. And again, this is the doctors. So should dentists be providing care in this space? You know, you say, well, if the doctors don't know it, maybe the dentists are going to know worse. It, there's a major component, and we didn't cover this yet. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the issues. Yes, the CDC has recommended that dentists provide prediabetes and diabetes prevention care, which should include, at a minimum, awareness, education, and screening. And let me read through this. This came out of, this was a study done using NHANES. NHANES is the National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Survey. It's like, it's become part of the census. And what they do is, you know, just like the census to find out who's, uh, who's in the country, what our trends are in terms of a population, they take a subsample of the census and do full-blown health and nutrition uh, 
uh, surveys as well as examination because then they can start understanding a little bit more about the health of our country. Now, let me read this quote out of that study. Screening for prediabetes at dental visits has the potential to alert an estimated 22.36 million adults of their risk for prediabetes or diabetes. Screening for prediabetes and diabetes during dental visits has the potential to raise patients' awareness of diabetes risk and prevent prediabetes from progressing to, to diabetes. For some patients, the dental visit may be the only point of contact with the healthcare system, which heightens the importance of including diabetes risk assessment for patient well-being. Pardon me, I don't know if, if you're getting this, but like everybody else I know, I'm getting a lot more robocalls these days. So dentists are in a unique position in terms of public health. They see patients' gums all day. And again, what do gums have to do with it? I mentioned that in the teaser in the beginning. Uh, gum disease is associated with heart attack and stroke. Why is that? Guess what the major cause of gum disease is? Prediabetes. It may not be a widely known fact, but inflamed reddish and bleeding gums are early warning signs of prediabetes. Prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance are all parts of the same disease process as type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's just that a bunch of uh, officials got together one day and decided we're not going to call it full-blown diabetes until it reaches a certain level. But it's the same disease process. This disease process leads to over 75% of cardiovascular inflammation, arterial plaque, heart attack, stroke, by far, this is the leading cause of heart attacks, which are the number one cause of death, and strokes, the number one cause of permanent disability, blindness, kidney damage, and among, uh, among other things. So if you're sitting on the other side of the camera saying, well, this doc's pushing it too hard, no, you're not going to get real damage until you get diabetes. Well, go back. I mean, we've covered this in several other videos. Go back and look at the, the research. Google uh, prevalence of retinopathy, eye damage, at the time of type 2 diabetes diagnosis. In other words, and you'll find it, it's between one and two thirds of people already have retinal disease, retinopathy, but before they have their diagnosis of full-blown diabetes, indicating, as you might think, if you're thinking rationally, prediabetes causes, causes this kind of damage too. It's not something that waits until you get a formal diagnosis of type two diabetes. Well, that's for other people, right? It's not for me. I don't have that problem. My dentist never told me that. Most dentists don't tell you that. They do what my dentist friends call drill, fill, and bill. In other words, they drill, they fill a cavity, and they bill the patient. They get so used to seeing gums, bleeding gums, that it just goes right over their head. But it's very common. As you see here, half of American adults suffer from gum disease. So, you know, you wanna con connect some dots. Half of American adults suffer from gum disease. Half of American adults have prediabetes. Prediabetes is the number one cause of gum disease. You know, if you just look at some of the more subtle uh, information out there, things start to become much clearer. In the U.S., the CDC and NIH said, yes, dentists should become uh, more involved in prediabetes awareness and, uh, and care. In the U.K., the Royal College of Surgeons has recommended this as well. Other groups support it as well. American Academy of Periodontology and the European Federation of Periodontology have given specific recommendations, and they are, practitioners should make patients aware of the evidence that periodontitis or uh, disease around the tooth, gum disease, is a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. Periodontitis patients with comorbidities, high blood pressure, increased body fat, tobacco use, et cetera, should see their doctor at a minimum yearly or be referred to other doctors. Practitioners should address risk factors in the dental setting 
in context of periodontal disease. For example, diet, smoking cessation, exercise, blood pressure, glucose checks. You know, as I mentioned before, and this came out of another article you see over here on the right. As I mentioned before, um, I, I was so, I understood it when I heard some docs that really didn't think prevention wise, didn't think health, uh, public health, didn't think population based. But I heard a, a recent, uh, just a couple of years ago, a doc in, who does prevention for a living. And they were talking about dentists uh, getting involved in this space. And his quote was, what are they doing? Do they want to play doctor? Ah, what can I say to that? Oh, in fact, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point for this next slide. So I haven't seen this movie. It's not really my taste, but it's a great example. And I found a blog recently by a dentist who's talking about that. It, you know, the comment was, do you mind if I take a look? I'm actually a doctor. Yeah, well, you're just a dentist. You're a dentist. Don't try and get fancy. You're only a dentist. And unfortunately, these quotes are very uh, way too common. It implies that dentists are going outside of their professional practice roles if they provide prediabetes prevention services. This is a negative impression, and this negative impression on dentists and their profession is only the tip of the iceberg. This physician elitist approach results in the loss of, pre, of valuable prediabetes prevention services. As I mentioned on the last slide, as in 22 million American adults not finding out that they have prediabetes. You know, there's just so many chunks, and this is one of the biggest ones, where adults are not finding out about this problem. So next week, we'll discuss resources and specific programs that could help uh, dentists in prediabetes management. Uh, what we will do next, I believe we have a little quote from, or a little clip from uh, that movie. Gilbert? Thanks, guys. So again, uh, if you will give us the uh, the water bowl in the next transition, we'll transition into Q and A now. So there we go. We've got uh, Bart Robinson here. We've got Joe Riley, as usual. Joe is uh, helping us in the back, uh, making sure that the systems don't go down again. Bob Weiss, good morning from North Georgia. Tested positive for COVID. Uh-oh. Just telemedicine with uh, primary care. Zinc, C, uh, vitamin C, D, Pepsi. You are spot on. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, thanks for sharing that with us and continue to hang in there. Keep doing the right stuff. I have been. Zinc CD, and I did not get it. Well, good. Amer al -Gayer. Hi from Germany. Hello, Amer. Thanks for joining us. ESL. Hi from Argentina. I don't recognize any names from Argentina yet. Thank you so much, ESL, for, for sharing that. Bambi Grage. We have another person named Bambi Abel. Um... Good morning from Northern California. Thank you so much, Bambi. Robert Simpson, it is not the dentist's responsibility, it's the PCP. Well, <clears throat> again, I go back to that 22 million. You know those 22 million people that we were talking about, Robert? Those were people that saw the dentist but never got in to see the doctor. So even if our, yes, I agree, it's the PCP's responsibility, but if we had enough PCPs to deal with this issue, uh, that would be one point. And again, if the PCPs that we have uh, knew effectively how to deal with this issue, that would be another one. But those 22 uh, million people that we talked about from the NHANES study, uh, even if the current PCPs knew, knew everything they needed to know and were performing the way they needed to, those 22 million would still not hear about it. My BJJ, good morning from Temecula. That's in California, and BJJ is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
Thanks again for your assistance in trying to get more universal screening for LP little a with LabCorp. Um, hopefully one day this will be part of the routine labs for all. So what BJJ is talking about is he sent me an email. He's, um, he uh, <clears throat> is starting a group uh, for awareness of LP little a. You uh, may remember, those of you who have it especially probably do, uh, LP little a is something that very few labs test for. Um, Quest didn't do it until they bought CHL, Cleveland, Cleveland Health Labs, and LabCorp doesn't include it in their basic uh, uh, screening either. Now, <clears throat> That's a problem. Uh, it reflects what's going on in the medical community. They didn't know how to deal with LP little a. Uh, LP little a does respond to niacin in most cases, but then there were some studies that said, well, maybe it still doesn't help. The reality is it does. There's clearly clearly evidence that it does, but we'll get into that argument some, some other time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, the point is, uh, it became much more well known when Bob Harper, the trainer for The Biggest Loser, uh, announced that his heart attack happened because of LP little a, which he got from his mom. And there are a ton of families out there who have LP little a passing through their family. LP little a is simply a genetic variation of LDL. We can talk about it more later. The other final comment I'll make though, is that the other reason that it's uh, come to light, again, three or four years ago, Bob Harper announced his heart attack was due to it. Young, obviously, or apparently very healthy and a heart attack, um, LP little a. There's now been some major progress in terms of uh, other types of treatment. There are new drugs called anti-sense drugs. Basically what they do they go into the, speaking of health literacy, we'll go into a little bit of our, uh, one of our geeky bunny holes. The antisense drugs go into the mechanisms of uh, our genetics. You know how you have the DNA in the cell, the DNA replicates, then you get a thing called messenger RNA, and then RNA that's used as a template to, um, to create the proteins. Well, with all of these, templates and mirror images going on. If you create one of those mirror images, you can stop that process. And that's exactly what the antisense drugs are. They have shown incredible uh, impact on LP little a values. The, uh, we reported on that, gosh, a couple of months ago, recent article coming out of the New England Journal. Is it ready for prime time in terms of the antisense drugs being available? Not yet. Do we have plenty of folks that have shared Yes, for example, we talked about Joe. Joe shared uh, several times on the channel and uh, Joe's had world-class level LP little A's. So thank you, BJJ. Oh, thank you for the, uh, for the super chat button and the reminder to others, go ahead and hit the like button. We don't have as many people today. We've got about 50 uh, on right now. The, uh, the reason is, and I'm not surprised, uh, people just tend not to care about dentists and their participation in our in prediabetes uh, dealing with this problem. So again, if you can help like it, you can help get more information out there. It would be greatly appreciated. Okay, Chuck. Hey, good morning, Doc. Do you have any thoughts or resources in coaching older relatives on type three diabetes? It can be a touchy subject. Actually, we do. Um, as you may or may not know, we were a full service provider for Dale Bredesen's uh, group for a couple of years. We still do a significant amount of, um, of that work. Janice, for example, is the only person that I know that is certified to do the MOCA. MOCA is an acronym, stands for Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment. Uh, don't want to get too political here, but uh, you may remember our president has had a couple of MOCA exams and has uh, uh, tweeted and gone on on interviews about getting uh, perfect or near perfect scores um, on his MOCA exams. No comment about that or about 
about any of that space. I don't like to get into uh, to politics. But that MOCA is a great uh, test. And again, very few people are, are certified in it. Um, we have several different resources in that space. If you want, if you want to find out more, uh, Chuck, you can call our number. You can see it on the internet. By the way, the number is 859-721-1414. Uh, <clears throat> Cruise liner. More things for dentists to sell should make them happy, especially if it's beneficial. You know, I've got a couple of dentist friends and uh, I've continued to encourage them in this space. I've seen a few dentists. If you look them up on the Internet, there are a few dentists that appear to be trying to make an income off of it. My dentist friends are pretty clear, though, that it's not really going to drive a lot of revenue for those guys. On the other hand, you can set it up where it uh, doesn't take a huge amount of their expenses or space or their time. Um, for example, one of the easiest, simplest things they can do is get a hemoglobin A1C um, uh, uh, thing. We all know there are huge problems with A1C and especially reliance on it. But again, that's a discussion for a different time. Old geezer 47. I'm sorry, Doc, but good health does not promote wealth. <clears throat> not sure where that came from and <laughs> uh, it's a good point you know, I, I guess you're responding to that old adage healthy wealthy and wise I'm um, not sure uh, we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of comments here starting to push on the on the stream my BJJ published on Monday in Journal of Alzheimer's Association a ketogenic drink with MCT improved cognition in MCI patients for those of you who don't know, MCI is um, minimal cognitive impairment. Uh, also, uh, there's also a thing called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. That's where the patient is um, uh, is aware or thinks that they've got some cognitive impairment, but nobody else sees it. So they say, you know what? I can't remember. I can't do math like I used to could. And it's like an accountant or somebody. And, he mentions it to people and and the other folks say, you're crazy. You're fantastic with math. Usually the patient is right with this SCI. That's one of the and that's a critical piece. It's a critical thing to know because that's when you're most likely to be able to reverse. Alzheimer's. Did I say that reversing Alzheimer's? In fact, go look at the. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, one of their biggest ad campaigns for the past year is he's alive or she's alive. They're out there <clears throat> and they're talking about the first survivor from Alzheimer's. When you sit in the uh, Dale Bredesen training programs, they've got a lot of uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of examples about folks reversing their uh, Alzheimer's issues. And <clears throat> one of the places, one of the reasons we got so involved is there's so much overlap. As I said a few minutes ago, uh, it's also called type three diabetes. Um, an interesting point that people, mo most people don't, don't know, not aware of. Insulin itself is used inside the brain as a, um, as to help one of the mechanisms for creating memories, for turning a perception into something that we remember. So there's a lot of overlap. Okay, uh, my BJJ, I think dentists can also play an important role in screening for oral cancers. Well, yeah. Much inconsistency here. Yep, that's the problem. Previous dentists did this early, looking for lesions. My new dentist does not. Hmm. <clears throat> Alex M, Alex M, metformin was recalled because of cancer side effects. You know what? We covered that a couple of times. Um, I don't think we had that. Uh, video in there. A uh, Aspen, if you could, if you could um, just send uh, Chris an email and remind him to put that in for the next few weeks. Uh, this, these recalls for the quote cancer side effects is NDMA, um, as in in uh, dimethyl uh, amine. It's a it's a very common side effect or side um, product of uh, chemical um, chemical processes used to make uh, medications. So this is not the first one. There have been antacids recalled for NDMA. 
There have been um, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs, uh, meaning like Ramipril, um, Losartan, different uh, blood pressure medications in those groups were called for it. And there have been multiple recalls of different uh, metformins. <clears throat> the recent recall is um, extend, uh, one of the brands of extended metformin. <clears throat> Again, a little bit of a scratchy throat today. Thank you for your patience with me on that. The bottom line is don't overread that. Don't stop taking your metformin because you've heard of this. If you have a concern, again, this time it's one of the extended release forms, check with your pharmacy. They'll tell you if, they're, if they're, they were using that brand and if you got it. Simra Basivan, thank you for your wonderful lessons. I shared with groups that they can learn so much from you. Thank you very much, Simra. I appreciate that. Uh, Sunity, is ApoB correlated with LDL? Yes. In other words, does high LDL mean high ApoB and vice versa? For the most part, yes. ApoB, uh, so Apo uh, A1 or apolipoprotein A1 is the protein that forms HDL particles. See, HDL is a particle that has not only cholesterol, sometimes it has fatty acids, uh, but it's formed from the, the protein. You know, you if I took, you can't see that because of, now you can see it. You should be able to see it if I put it in front of, well, anyway. If you put water in a in a bottle, I mean oil in a bottle of water, it would form a big blob. Well, uh, that's because oil and water don't mix. But you know what? We eat oils. Um, we eat fats. So, and our blood is 90 of what? 98% water. So why don't we get these big blobs in our blood? If we did get those big blobs, and occasionally we do, they can cause heart attack and stroke and really, really bad things. So when, when does that happen? With trauma. You know, people are in major car wrecks. They end up breaking multiple large bones. Fat from the uh, from the bone marrow causes uh, can cause can re get released into the bloodstream and cause what the, we call those fat embolisms. They can cause major strokes, ma major heart attacks, other problems, just like uh, we talk about on this channel all the time. Why did I go down that bunny hole? because that's nature's way. That's our body's way of preventing that from happening. It makes proteins. That's what it always does. It makes proteins to deal with this problem or that problem. The protein that forms, and the, the proteins form these tiny particles, which are microscopic. They don't join with other oil or fat particles, so they don't create those big fat blobs, which would kill us. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, ApoB is the other big one. ApoB forms the particles for LDL. It also forms the particles for IDL, intermediate, uh, intermediate density lipoproteins, and VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. I mentioned those two. Why don't you see IDL and VLDL very often, for example, on tests? Because those come basically uh, for a half an hour or so after eating. They come from the GI tract when this ApoB is absorbing the fats and oils that you've eaten. And they tend to get metabolized and turned into other stuff like LDL and HDL. LDL and HDL have half-lives, you know, where, whereas IDL and VLDL have half-lives of 10, 15, 30 minutes. The uh, HDL and LDL have them in days. That's why the typical test is going to look at those and not, uh, HDL and LDL, but not at IDL and VLDL. I hope that uh, was an enjoyable uh, sled ride down a bunny hole for uh, some of the geeks, the, the healthcare geeks, the health geeks out there, medical science geeks. So BJJ, appointment today with mom's memory doc. She's my, she has mild dementia. Loaded for bear with research to argue for metformin. I would certainly clearly think about metformin and, and focusing very much on prediabetes for, uh, for any patient heading down that path of uh, cognitive decline. She also has prediabetes, not, not a big surprise. But I'll tell you, 
what's exciting is to hear that you already know about it. So many people have the cognitive decline and don't know that they have prediabetes. I expect resistance from the doc because I uh, brought her A1C down with diet. Mm, good luck on that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And BJJ is giving examples of what we we're talking about earlier on. You know, speaking of health healthcare literal, literacy, um, quite often the folks that know and keep up with this channel know a lot more than the doctors that they're dealing with. And you have to accept that as well. So not only is BJJ uh, dealing with his mom on this issue, he's likely to have to help the doctor understand some things that the doctor's not likely to understand yet. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Samson, I have lipo L L LP little a off the charts. Well, I wonder what off the charts means because I've got a bunch of folks that have it way over 500. And I believe Joe shared one time that his has gotten what? 800, 900? I mean, just that's off the charts. Are there any test studies looking for subjects available for the antisense medicine? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. I meant to mention that early on. Obviously, I've got a lot of patients with LP little a. And that's the big question for the uh, for those folks. Can I get in those studies? Can I go get the antisense drug? Number one, you know, think about it. Number one, uh, just because you get in the study, it's still randomized. You don't know if you're getting the antisense drug or or nothing. The bigger point, though, is I'm not aware of any study. I've had a couple of patients that found a whole bunch of them, uh, made other people aware of them tried to get into them and they couldn't find any that were taking new patients at this point. John Tocho, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you for another excellent session. Uh, Vinu Gopal, is being vegan good for your health? Ah, uh, you know, just like I don't like to wade into politics, I don't like to wade into this debate about diet. But here's the thing. Way over half of us, and, and by the time we're age 60, way over half of us can't metabolize carbohydrates very well. So that's what's dangerous, eating carbohydrates if you have prediabetes. And a lot of people, as we mentioned, have full-blown diabetes, and they didn't know it, their doctor didn't know it. So for those people, eating carbs is going to burn their arteries. Now, why did I go there about carbs? You asked about vegan. Obviously, in your typical vegan diet, it's uh, easier to, to eat carbs, access carbs. But I will say this. I've done it for demonstration purposes. You can go completely keto, as in extremely low carb, on a vegan diet. You just get most of your calories from oils like uh, olive oil, the most popular one, but there are also other oils like avocado oil that, and others. So I'm a little bit less concerned. I know a lot of people have focused on, on vegan versus uh, animal or carnivore. And, you know, for the vegan, a lot of times it's for ethical reasons or belief reasons or whatever. And, and that's fine. But again, you need to know if you can metabolize carbs uh, before you eat a whole bunch of them. And if you need this, if you need or want to stay uh, vegan or plant-based, um, then just you know, know that you've got work to do in that space. Thank you, great question. MB, what do you think of the guided biofilm therapy? That's not ringing any bells. It uses air polishing to clean teeth. Oh, okay. And soft tissue sub and supra gingivally in a very minimally invasive way. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't. I think that's very interesting. Um, very interesting. And I don't have an opinion on that. I'll have, I'll have to ask some of my dentist friends. Farouk Far, I haven't heard from you in quite a while, Farouk. Farouk is, oh, gosh, pardon my American viewpoint. I think it's in Iran. Uh, and one of his, I think, cousin died, a very young cousin died early on in the COVID, uh, the COVID outbreak. I think Farouk is a healthcare professional and has shared a lot with us. 
my doctor said I have no problems regarding my my phone sugar. After watching Dr. B, I asked for an OGTT. When I hit, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but I hear this. This happens so many times. My doctor said I had no problems. I asked for, a, for an OGTT. I hit 220, full-blown diabetes. Thank you, Dr. B. Thank you so much, Farouk, for sharing that. Um, and it's, you know, typically when patients have that, it's it, it, originally I used to be very concerned because, you know, anytime you hit 200 or above, you, you hit one of the major and most common criteria for full-blown di diabetes. And patients, and there's some argument, there are some people who say, oh, that's, that's crazy. Actually, even some doctors would say, <coughs> um, these tests are, quote, rigged to fail. That's what John Lorscheider's doc said. Um, and you, you still don't have a problem. And then John went to see his ophthalmologist a week later and the ophthalmologist said, oh yeah, you do. You've got eye disease, diabetic eye disease. Um, so some people would quibble over the 200 cut point and say, oh no, if it's in the peak of an OGTT, then two, the over 200 doesn't count. You know what? <clears throat> I would just go back to that Clint Eastwood quote. Are you feeling lucky? Do you really want to say that you don't have that problem? Farouk obviously doesn't. And thank you so much, Farouk, for sharing that. That's a big, big deal. Uh, and again, it happens over and over and over again. And yes, you didn't mean phone sugar. I didn't think you did. You meant blood sugar. My BJJ ApoB correlates with LDLP particles, but I believe there can be a discordance between LDLC mass and ApoB, particularly if an individual has high and small LDLP. So <clears throat> you're starting to get into uh, the issue of fractionation, and if you go back, I didn't, we didn't mention that in our early in our intros, but if you go back, we did a, a couple of. Um, videos, uh, YouTube lives on uh, triglyceride over HDL. And in those, we actually showed some fractionation charts. Um, I, I try to go find those, but when I do, you know, I shouldn't go for trying to find something on my desktop, on my computer while we're presenting. Uh, the bottom line is um, it gets way deep into this whole question of of mass, uh, fractionation, particle count, et cetera. The bottom line is uh, we tend to get a shift to the left or a shift towards the smaller, denser, more dangerous LDL particles. Again, guess what? From prediabetes, diabetes. You tend to get that, also get a shift to the left on that bell curve of HDL particles. That one looks different though. It's not just a shift of a continued bell curve. It looks like a shark came along and took a big bite out, out of the bell curve. But the same thing is happening with both of those uh, HDL and LDL populations. What's going on is uh, the lipase uh, that's out there it, or in our bodies, it, there are several different versions of it. Some peripheral lipase out in the body fat areas, some lipase in our uh, liver. Bottom line is though that uh, fatty acids um, are getting, um, are transferring into those large, fluffy LDL and HDL, the ones that we want to have when we have a sugar problem. When those transfer into there and, it, and they go back to the liver, the liver uh, metabolizes those. It burns them up and it burns up the large, fluffy HDL and the large, fluffy LDL as it burns up the, uh, the fatty acids that they contain. So, Again, a very clear marker within the lipid fractionation or cholesterol fractionation point um, showing whether or not you have uh, prediabetes, carb metabolism problems. If you have deeper questions about that, obviously it's a lot easier once you start seeing the actual bell curves and the actual pictures. And that's on that, uh, again, it was about a month ago. Thank you, it was a good point, BJJ. Ann Sampson, been on keto, very low carbs for a year. Having an OGTT, do you carb load 150 grams for two or three days before the test? I recommend it, but we'll talk about it for just a, a, a minute. 
heard both numbers or does it matter? Uh, <clears throat> yes. So you get what you uh, what you prepare for. So if you want to know what kind of um, what kind of uh, shape your body is in or would be in if you were using the standard American diet with the high carbs, then yes, go ahead and load it for a couple of days. There's another reason to go ahead and carb load for a couple of days for this. And that is, um, it's called stored insulin. There are two, there's an early and a late phase of insulin response to carbs. The early phase is from stored insulin. The late phase comes from insulin that your pancreas makes in response to that challenge. That early phase is very important. Uh, those of you who are familiar with seeing these curves on a craft insulin survey, you realize that that whole, one of the first things that we tend to see is that whole uh, phase tends to move from a 30 minute response to a two, three hour response uh, before we start managing our blood sugar. Uh, if, you, if you don't load, if you're on keto all the time and you don't load with carbs, then your pancreas will have had a totally unnatural, unrealistic opportunity <clears throat> to slowly uh, add back and store carbs. There's yet another reason to go ahead and do the, the carbs. It has to do with what they call a, a, uh, a fad associated um, uh, insulin response, but not going to go there. So I recommend routinely for most cases, yes, go ahead and do that carb loading. Thank you so much for your interest. Uh, had a lot of great questions today and um, we will get back to you in, uh, in about a week.